So welcome everyone to the Keyboard Weekly Community Meeting. Uh, my name is Daniel Hiller. I am uh, your interim host uh, since Andrew is out this week. Um, I have a bit of background noise because I'm sitting at the conference room where we are attending. We are at Red Week, so um, please uh, disregard that. So. Um, first of all, uh, I would like uh, you to um, make clear that we want everyone to join the community if you have the uh, opportunity to do that. Uh, first of all, you can add your organization to the adopters markdown, which you will find the link inside the Cupid Community Meetings um, document. Then also you can follow us on, follow us on Twitter or um, visit our community page. And finally, if you want to uh, contribute, then please apply for joining us as a GitHub project member. So my question now is um, whether we have any new members this week that would like to introduce themselves. Okay, so I guess no new ones. By the way, I just forgot to mention that. Please add your attendance inside the community meetings document. So, okay, then let's move on to the agenda and notes if anyone, um, if no one wants to introduce themselves. Uh, first of all, I have a, um, an announcement to make um, in uh, in place for Andrew, um, who wants to notify everyone that um, there are two call for papers that are ending soonish. First of all, is a scale uh, South California conference um, that will end. Uh, the, the call for paper will end on first of November. The second one is a KubeCon, um, which uh, of which a call for paper proposal range will end on twenty sixth of November. Um, so if people have an idea that they want um, to uh, present somehow and partner, um, Andrew proposed to try and facilitate, facilitate that by following up, chasing it down. Um, so if you have time for that and want to do that, please uh, get back to us inside the, for example, like the KubeWord um, dev um, Slack channel, for example. Seek us out and understand so we can can help you. So next point is by Miguel. Uh, Miguel, are you there? I am. Hey, stage is yours. Okay. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out, and I really don't know what's our criteria uh, in the community for bumping the the Kubernetes uh, API dependencies on the Go mod. Like right now, we're pinning the 1.26.4 version. And for, for some reason, uh, which I will explain later, uh, we're interested or my team is interested in bumping that to 1.28. And I'm just wondering, like, what's the current, uh, I don't know, policy we have in store for this? Is there even a policy for this? When do we bump GoMod? Actually, from my understanding, if I can start speaking here, um, I would expect normally to, um, to have this API upgrade happening after the latest Cupid provider has been updated. Um, I, for one, have not seen that um, happening at the same time when we upgraded the providers. Mm -hmm. But I think, so just to answer your question, I think there is no policy. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I think, I think that we should probably introduce something um, that we would want to have something uh, in a tense because I, I don't know if you agree, but I guess that it should be this bump should be made whenever we are introducing a new provider that has might have API updates, right? Totally. So 
would you probably want to start the conversation somewhere on the mailing list or would you just want to create a PR in introducing such yeah, a uh, such a policy? So let's put it this way, both. Uh, I think it's fair to start a conversation and really understand what is it that we really want to do. But right now uh, we're on a pickle. So yeah, we'll probably just shoot a PR as well. And uh, so let me try to put some more context, like uh, in Oven Kubernetes, which is a CNI plugin, uh, they want to bump their API to Kubernetes 1.28, but they cannot because they are consuming our API, which is pinning 1.26. And the thing is, we are uh, asking features from them and we have integration tests there to ensure that our features uh, are not broken and we are preventing their API from being updated. So right now we are really bad citizens in that ecosystem. And that's what I'm really trying to prevent. So at the same time, I think that yes, we should come up with some sort of policy, but right now I'd really uh, rather try to bump this to 1.28, at least for us to get more time to to fall on their well to fall back into their good graces i guess yeah i think that sounds fair that sounds absolutely fair what what do others think uh, i have a question are there any risks uh with 1.28 upgrade because uh if there are API deprecations that we depend on, then that will be the only question to validate before the bump. Yeah, I thought about that. I cannot say that I have thought it thoroughly, but I thought about that. And I guess that we would see that on the CI lanes. So for bad or worse, we are running, so let's say I, I, I put a PR out there to bump the API to 1.28, and this will be executed against version 1.28, 1.27, and 1.26. And if there's something invalid there, well, it'll break, and we'll figure it out. Okay. Or at yeah. least we'll see it. See your question here in the chat. How is it possible that they depend on a specific project like Qvert? Uh, their tests do depend on our API so that our feature is not broken. How did they accept that? Uh, it beats me, but it's happening. The I guess the long story short is we've asked some features from them. They went ahead and implemented it and we put tests there to ensure that the features we're requesting from them are not broken uh, when they do their work, I guess. And now they eat our API. Yeah, so from what I understand, the first thing, so maybe we should somehow integrate that into the schedule since we are already trying to bump the Kubernetes CI provider to use the latest Kubernetes version. And only after that has happened, we can even bump the, the Kubernetes API. Is that correct? That makes sense. Of course, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe something like integrating that into the schedule somehow could, could could make sense to just um, add something like a uh, bump the API right after the latest Kubernetes provider. And uh, I think currently we are consuming at the earliest, we are con consuming the RC provider. And then right after that has happened so that it has landed, then we can only bump the API. Makes sense to me. Yeah, so I would just probably add that to the notes. Um,
Okay, I added that one to your point. I hope that Perfect. catches it somehow. Okay, great. Um, so, any other opinions on that? Uh, one, one more suggestion. I think since we are going from 126 to 128, that means uh, we will hit the applications in 20, say, 27. So it might be worth it going through the API deprecation page that Kubernetes publishes for 127, just as a heads up uh, of what kinds of problems we could expect in CI. Totally makes sense. Like the, the more, uh, let's say, insights or the more, let's say, the heads up that we'll get from it is uh, totally important to kind of uh, know what to prepare for or know what to be on the lookout for. That's a good point. Yeah, um, I sent the link and the only API in 127 that was deprecated was CSI storage capacity. So uh, if we depend on that, we will probably run into issues. Um, everything else looks good. There is a storage account secret deprecation, automatic secret creation, and there is few APIs which got promoted from alpha one to alpha two. So that's it. We just went through the major rebase from this two six to two eight same on the different project. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks Miguel tackling that. So um, I would expect that you start the conversation or put out the PR somehow and you can, if you want, you can just ping me on that one. And I'll try to support that somehow. That sounds fair. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks. Thank you. I think that should have happened earlier, <laughs> to be honest. But yeah, so sometimes we don't have time for that. OK, um, so since we don't have any other agenda and notes items, or does anyone want to fill in anything on the uh, last second? I have an open question, which I, I wasn't in a last meeting, uh, community meeting. And we are very early adopters of Kubeweird. We're still evaluating it within our organization. But the email for dropping rootful VMs got a bit us on the edge. And I just had a question, a hypothetical question to the community. If we as organization think that we need this feature, and I saw that proposal for deprecation and things like that, what would be the hypothetical requirements from you as a community to keep it instead of deprecating? I saw the lack of testing currently. I'm just wondering, is this still on a table or is the decision that to de-deprecate that is already decided? Like just to get an input. Because we, we have a strong feeling that we're going to need it, but we're still early in the taking it out and proving it. Well, I think the primary concern as you had touched on is the testing. Uh, and so we're just not sure we're not breaking it, you know, from one feature to the next as we're adding uh, new code and not necessarily running that as a gating lane or, or even running it on current Kubernetes versions. So that would be something to, to consider is how we could get the resources for testing. Um, past that, I think that the, the tone of the email, I mean, we, we're still, you're right, the, the email sort of, the, the thread concluded with, hey, let's proceed with a, a deprecation policy. But if there's a long-term need that is just not gonna go away, uh, 
we can possibly reconsider that. We're, we're even, <laughs> to be completely honest, looking at it uh, going, gee, how are we going to do our own features uh, that require you know, root in that case? Um, you know, one comes to mind is vert IOFS. There are modes, like if you run it rootless, it, it has impact. It, it can be done, but it, it it's a little bit clunky for as far as the user experience. So it's just better with root. Um, and so if I, I'm taking your raising the topic here as um, a, a petition to just do away with the whole idea of deprecating it and not deprecate it. I'm, like you mentioned the resources in a testing. Um, what, do you, what do you mean? Is like a computer resources testing or somebody maintaining the tests? Like physically. The compute resources. I mean, right now we're using, and, and Daniel, the one typing, <laughs> doing two things at once, is most familiar with uh, the the number of servers and what have you that we've got uh, that are automatically triggered when you know, GitHub commits happen uh, mm -hmm. or are authorized for testing. Uh, there, there, we only have a finite number of resources for that purpose. And so we're always looking to streamline the number of lanes or streamline how the lanes run in order to uh, use our, our infrastructure most efficiently. And sorry, I'm just, again, still new. The resources currently imagine is, uh, is like, are you in, within the PRO infrastructure or CI, CD is like, Imagine it's somehow hosted by Red Hat partially, or it's community owned. I'm just I'm trying to understand the options. Let's say hypothetically, we as organization we find it useful, we need it. We say okay, we can help it, either financially or by resources or something. Is that an option on the table? What's like, what's the sure? I mean, I think right now uh, we're using and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Daniel, we're using uh, Red Hat resources for the actual running of the CI CD. Um, but if I remember how GitHub triggers work for commit hooks, uh, I think you could do for more than one server farm. And it, it could be something that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily even need to commit to testing everything, but you could test that feature. Okay, so you use and, GitHub CI and that's basically worker sign somewhere Red Hat infrastructure. So it's not the no. OpenShift CI prowl and which I'm familiar with. Actually, so to chime in here, so we're actually using a prowl cluster, which is not only the prowl cluster itself, but it's a it's a set of clusters. So we have a control plane cluster, um, and we have a workloads cluster, and we have some other clusters that are sponsored by ARM and by AMD to test that stuff. So like ARM is tested on the separate ARM cluster and AMD SCV, for example, is also tested on the AMD SCV cluster. Um, so we have methods to attach the uh, testing clusters um, to our control plane cluster. If you uh, think that would be an option that you would want to proceed mm -hmm. to ARM. Okay, so that, I think that answers my question. I just basically wanted to understand what's the, what's the options like uh, we're gonna jump in a bit higher pace of evaluation. I, I suspect that in a month's window, we're gonna know if this particular feature, I said it's one triggered our eyesight in a mailing list is needed or not. And I think if we decide that is yes, I think we're gonna, I think I will be coming back and trying to reopen this question. But for now, yeah, I really appreciate the answer. Appreciate the input. I mean, I mean, just to, just to chime in on that, my 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 high level view on that was that first of all, um, the thing is that currently the root for support is completely untested, if I understand correctly. And the second one is that we think, or that at least a couple of people have thought that we have parity with root less VMs according to root for VMs. So please, if I'm talking garbage here, please correct me. Um, but I think that was my take on that. Hi, Lubo here. Uh, yeah, you are completely right. So we think the party is there, and uh, that's why we can drop the root and uh, get away with Celeste maintenance, basically, from our side. You mean the um, feature parity? Yeah, the feature party should, should be there, as far as we know. Okay. Uh, let and us know if, the... if no, and 
we can work on it. Yeah, and if that, I think that is the lacking test, I think at minimum we can contribute those back or try to write those. As I said, we, we're gonna see. Cool. And, and while we don't test the root like on every PR, we still have the periodics and I think they are passing right now. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel. Um, actually, actually, I don't know, but I think, <laughs> and also I think we we uh, uh, attached a bunch of um, pre-submits and can that can be triggered manually if if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, we have those for PRs which we think that could break root. Um, uh, let me just have a look on the test grid quickly. And just do it. Oh, the to the prow instance you use is the one in the cube ecosystem one. It's not an eco. Uh, it's not a. It's not a Kubernetes ecosystem one. It's our own instance. But it uh, the test grid. It's publishing oh. towards the test grid so that you can at least uh, see all the, okay, so, so, the things there. So I'm just. Uh, so the pro one is the OpenShift release one? Did, Actually, uh, I didn't like, get your question, sorry. The, the pro configuration, it sits in the OpenShift release repository or somewhere else? No, it's not. That, that's all OpenShift centered. We have uh, our own uh, project infra repository inside ah, the okay. Kubebird organization. Yeah, thanks. That's where like, the I, I, used to, I used to work for Red Hat yeah. and I know the OpenShift land, so I'm just trying to connect the dots. <laughs> yeah, true. Sure, sure. Just go ahead. So again, so the, the uh, GitHub Kubebird uh, project infra repository holds everything that we uh, that we have for configuration of the Pro instance and, and the complete infrastructure configuration. Cool, thanks. Okay, I think I, I took enough of your time. Thank you. All good. I, this is I the have... app, right? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, I had a look at the periodics and they are passing a, the only one which is not passing is in compute, but I uh, guess that's uh, some issue with the test suite or some kind of timeout. Uh, so tests are passing just, we need to fix some lame stuff. Cool. Um, I have a quick question regarding this discussion. Um, what is the timeline of uh, the decision that we need to take here? Uh, is there uh, like within a month or something we're going to make that decision? Um, I would no like timeline. to on my side. Well. <laughs> Sorry to talk, Herbie. I thought you were done. I'm, I apologize. Uh, no timeline. Uh, at this point, I think that you know, what was said on email was proposing roughly 122 for deprecation and a version or two later for, you know, for actually removing. But it, the point of that email thread was to sound off and give a, get a pulse check on community concern or interest in the feature. And I'm kind of hearing a lot of real valid concern that we shouldn't be deprecating it. So from my point of view, I think that we should probably consider, but we probably should table any sort of uh, aggressive stance on trying to deprecate it. That was never the point, you know, it was, it was, we were honestly fact-finding when we started that thread. So I think we got our answer. Yes, but I think we cannot ignore the fact that it causes us also maintenance issues in terms of supporting it. So we cannot, we cannot ignore it. Like if uh, the people that need to support it, the maintainers, they are not growing in in the same amount of, uh, with the same amount of features that we had. And this uh, root or rootless is, uh, is a matrix. So it is also an issue, not only the testing, I think. Yeah, that's a really fair point. The, the point is actually that it's also consuming compute resources from the prior cluster when it's running in CI, right? And uh, those resources are, of course, somehow um, 
limited to a point and um, if we don't need to support them since we think that we have feature parity um, we we just can can use the resources for something else yes but that's that's the the resources from the the hardware resources or those co compute resources that we need i'm saying that there are also resources from the people that maintain the project so in order I mean, at some point, we need to clean things up that are not used. If this is not possible to remove it, then fine. But it's also, a, it has a weight on the decision here. There are like multiple conditions in the code about it. So it's not free. Yeah, no, I think like, we understand that like uh, maybe in an open source world, long enough to know that if you ask something, you have to give something back. So I don't want to make promises now, but let's say if we evaluate and we see that it's needed, I suspect we are gonna be more involved in the community and helping too in the long run if we end up adopting the project. So yeah, I just don't want to create perception like what if I said, if we're gonna adopt it as a part of our product base and product, I suspect we will see more of us in the meetings and get help. Sorry, Actually, I, I knew that like... sounds great. Sorry, sorry, Lou, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I don't like, so I want to ask if you are actually using root or you just uh, wondering uh, what's the impact on you? Uh, we, we directly don't. We're building products for our customers. Our customers do. So this is where we need to look a bit how to extend our current virtualization stack basically move away from what we have to Qbert and see if, if it's needed or not. So this is why I'm saying we need to evaluate it because it's a, like you're asking us, we have to evaluate it and go and ask our customers. And if they say yes, basically it's a circle of life. Understood. Yeah, if you, if you get any feedback on why they cannot use it on road, uh... That's a valid thing we the, want to hear. The signal we're hearing now, and it's it's a very vague one, is uh, that we want to use this and they currently use this for the legacy applications where we just basically snapshot the VMs from somewhere and want to run it, where we're not willing to invest into the like changing the configurations and things like that. And we don't know if this stuff is feasible in the way like that like for the applications which relies on the root user and root behavior written in 90s and things like that, left and shift basically stuff. But we don't know that until we tried. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're always of course happy to have more uh, community people that contribute to the project, right? So, um, welcome and thanks. Um, so, if there is nothing else to add from that, uh, we could uh, open another topic if you want. Oops. Okay, I guess then that concludes the open floor. Actually, I didn't really introduce it right away. So if there is something for the open floor, please go ahead now. Okay, so then let's take a look at the pull requests that need attention. I have seen one that is the improved CPU hot block test, but I Think that it has a bit of attention already. Let's take a quick look. I have looked at that myself, so I think we are, should be okay here. I just, Lubo, I, to be fair, I just need to finish up that. Um, I have a proposal on that one um, yeah, that I would true. probably um, extract a, a, an expectation method somehow, if that sounds fair to you that we can use in a couple of uh, points where the similar expectation um, is used. 
Sounds good to me. I mean, the line is not blocking. A, uh, yeah, I would just, in the long run, expect it to also include these kind of tests. And I don't want to, as, as I said, I don't want to use the skip because that's a wrong practice, in my opinion. Yeah, actually fair. So yeah, we had this discussion a lot of times, I think. So let's don't not go down that rabbit hole again. <laughs> Thanks. So, okay, so let's see if we have any others. I think that there is nothing else. So then take a quick look at the mailing list review. Yeah, this one, the Qbert or GitHub installation request has cleared out itself somehow. Um, so that was from the OpenShift team that uh, wanted to add this um, since a couple of our projects are, are still using um, OpenShift CI. So we had to add that other bot. Um, so the second one is uh, there is something an announcement in, inside the virtualization linting library I'm not familiar with that does anyone to anyone want to chime in on that or did anyone take a look at that and and uh, want to talk about that one Michal Prevoznik I hope that's really spoken out correctly I guess you're not there right I don't think my Michal is here, uh, but like the summary is, um, there could be a configuration of the VM which might not be the most performance, let's say, and this linting tool can uh, give a warning to a user, hey, this this is not optimal. I think for for Qbeard, uh, this might be redundant. Uh, for example, if we uh, have a look on the NUMA stuff, uh, the Kubernetes uh, CPU manager already supports uh, aligning to one NUMA node or other policies uh, which would hurt the performance. So it's something up in the air if we are going to integrate or not, uh, I believe, at this point. Mm. So I'm feeling like um, that since there is no feed, real rich feedback on that announcement somehow that the interest might not be that high and but yeah so it should at least be fair probably to um yeah to so, give a bit of feedback somehow so yeah definitely de definitely that's what we want to do like we want to try it out and see if there is any case in Qbeer that uh this is not covered by, for example, Kubernetes stuff like CPU or memory managers and, and et cetera. Mm. Fair. Okay, so I understand that, that the feedback is still underway and that we are somehow on the way to tackling this one. Okay. Thank you then. Okay, so then next one would be the bug scrub. Let me see. You. Um, yeah, that one is by Brian. There is something regarding VM migrations that are failing on clusters with cryo version V128. I'm not sure, Brian, if you're there, you, if you would want to chime in on that. Okay, sounds like Brian is not there. I think this, the 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 root of all this is that, um, or the, the the problem with that is that uh, we actually should be using Cryo one twenty eight since we are using the Kubernetes one one twenty eight, but we can't because the latest uh, one twenty eight release of Cryo breaks the migration. So um, I think we had um, created issues on that, and um, yeah, so I can just describe the state. I can't do anything about that right now just so that you are informed. So the second one that Andrew highlighted is this exported image is not bootable. This thing, this looks like a Windows 22 VM machine using ISO file virtual drivers. 
to export PVC to Uh -huh. Interesting. Raw image been bootable. I think at first I'd say there is a lot of information missing. I think we should at least expect some um, VM YAML or something. So I'm adding the triage needs information. Or would anyone be able to um, look at that without that information? I guess not, right? Okay, so I take that as a yes. Okay, next one, what kind of create VM with volume import? So to be honest, I don't want to bounce that, uh, like like just uh, playing it back to him somehow. But I think that that we actually need that information to understand what what he's trying to say. So please right. chime in if like, you disagree. It's not it's not even clear which Windows twenty two subversion it's been used because there is multiple. Yeah, maybe I should I should have said that. Please provide as much information as possible somehow. But yeah, so that also gets us into a rabbit hole of length of log files somehow. So I just didn't want to want to overcomplicate everything. So okay, this one is the boot cutter create VM with volume import. This sounds like oh, that is from Felix. Okay, so that's just a placeholder, I think. Felix is not there, right? Okay, so I guess that this one is just rated how to. Let me see, we have a good country with more import type. Um, someone from storage there, is that something that? looks like a bug regarding storage stuff or uh, could you scroll up a bit sure so... uh looks like a placeholder placeholder felix created for himself maybe and a pr is made i and thought I the same but i was just asking whether you see something directly or something like that there's a link to the pull request and and the title. Ah, oh, I see. I just overlooked that. Looks yeah, kind of great. They, okay, they have it. Yeah, they have it under control. I think. Okay, so then then all is good. Thanks for the heads up. Okay, so. I guess that you noticed already. We have a new section of flaky test fixes um which we want to uh, advertise because i think this is always a big topic in our uh code base so let me take a quick look at that one that ah yeah that that was something that you um uh, that you commented about before in another meeting right so that's actually that's actually a bug that's been fixed not a flaky test right um yeah and the, the the fix might not be uh, final yet. It's it's complicated. So still looking at that. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks for that. You pray to that you that you added that comment on that. So so to be more clear, this section is actually really for flaky test fixes. Flaky behavior is not a flaky test, but it's a bug. <laughs> okay, so I think we are done regarding the normal uh, schedule. So anything else that anyone wants to mention at the last minute?
Okay, then. Thanks everyone for your attendance um, to this Qubit community meeting. Um, have a nice rest of your week and see you next week in the next community meeting. Bye Thank everyone. Thank you. Enjoy your Edgar week. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> see you. Bye.